And so next I'll just spend a very brief amount of time uh, talking about functional assays of enhancers. And so, um, you know, one of the primary purposes of doing uh, epigenomic profiling is to not only identify chromatin states and where they are in the genome and what their behavior is, but also primarily to identify, identify for example, active regulatory elements in different cell types, um, and therefore, you know, identify putative enhancers that regulate protein coding genes and then identify, okay, within these enhancers, where are all the real binding sites and where are all the, um, you know, important positions of the binding sites and things like this. And so that's where functional assays of enhancers really come into play. And so there's a long history of uh, different reporter assays that have been developed over the past few decades uh, in order to test for enhancer activity or more generally regulatory element activity. Um, one of the most kind of classic famous ones is called the luciferase assay. And so here I'll illustrate how the luciferase assay is used um, in the context of a kind of an epigenetic or high C ex experiment, a typical one anyways. And so here in, uh, in this figure from one particular study that was looking at the FOXP2 locus. Um, so FOXP2 is, is basically a, one of the really important transcriptional regulators in humans. It's involved in, uh, it's implicated in a lot of human diseases. Um, in this particular study, the authors wanted to kind of characterize the transcriptional regulation of FOXP2 in different cell types. And so as part of that, they want to basically identify uh, different sets of enhancers that regulate uh, the FOXP2 transcription. And so the idea here is that the authors basically first took a few different cell lines and they basically performed a series of 3C experiments where they were looking for different uh, chromosome regions uh, that were physically interacting with the FOXP2 transcription start site. And so here, what I've shown you, what I've boxed here in red are basically three different regions uh, across a couple of different cell types in which the authors found a lot of kind of a surprising number of physical interactions between uh, those individual loci and the transcription start site of FOXP2. And so here I've also numbered them based on their kind of relative position in kilobases uh, relative to the transcription start site. And so what happened here is that after the authors identified these three candidate regions uh, for enhancers that interact with FOXP2 transcription start site. Um, what the authors then did is they tried to narrow down exactly where in these regions the uh, putative enhancer uh, elements were. Because part of the problem with using, for example, 3C assays uh, is that in this particular study, they used the BGL2 restriction enzyme, uh, which basically led to a set of genomic fragments uh, of size around 1 to 10 KB. And so the thing is that your typical enhancer might be somewhere between like say two and 800 base pairs. Uh, and so your one to 10 KB regions are much larger than your typical enhancer size. And so what they did to try to kind of narrow down the enhancer region within these loci is they then uh, looked at uh, different epigenetic marks. So more specifically, they were looking at uh, K27 acetylation and K4ME1, which are marks of active, active enhancers. Uh, and based on uh, those marks, they basically identified much smaller regions, uh, basically specific target enhancers within each of those regions that they wanted to test. So once they identified the three candidate enhancer sequences, what they then did is they used the luciferase assay to test the enhancer functionality of those three candidates uh, in different cell types. And so the, the general idea here is that for each candidate enhancer from those three regions, what they did is they cloned these enhancers upstream of a minimal promoter uh, that controlled a firefly uh, luciferase reporter gene. Uh, and then they transfected different cell lines with this, uh, with this report construct uh, and just measured the relative luciferase activity um, of these enhancer elements in each one of these cell types compared to uh, these cell lines where they just transfected uh, a construct with no enhancer cloned upstream of the minimal promoter. So the idea here is that uh, luciferase is uh, what's known as a bioluminescent reporter. And so basically what you're measuring is essentially light output um, from these cells. And so bioluminescent reporters in general are different from the fluorescent probes or the fluorophores that we talked about uh, before in the DNA sequencing lecture. Uh, in the sense that the way the fluorophores worked is that 
basically you had some kind of light source which you shone light uh, on the cells and so the fluorophores basically absorb energy from the light and then they emit a, a light at a different wavelength from the one that you shone on the cells. And so in contrast for the bioluminescent reporters uh, like luciferase, what they're doing is that you're actually supplying uh, luciferase with some kind of substrate where the substrate you use kind of depends on which homologue of luciferase you use. And basically what happens is luciferase basically catalyzes, uses the substrate to catalyze an enzyme reaction, which then generates light on its own. And so bioluminescent reporters like luciferase are typically used uh, to test enhancer expression instead of the fluorophores because compared to fluorophores, uh, they tend to be more sensitive and they can detect, they, they have what's called a higher dynamic range of measurable expression compared to fluorophores. And so what that means is that you can detect both lower levels of enhancer activity as well as higher levels of activity. Um, and so it's worth pointing out that among the different bioluminescent reporters that you can use, uh, luciferase is one of the most commonly used ones, mainly because, number one, you don't need any post-translational modification uh, of luciferase to initiate enzyme activity. And secondly, it's not toxic, even at really high concentrations um, in different types of cells. And so that, that holds true for even like prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells in general. And so one of the major limitations of the luciferase assay is its throughput in the sense that you can't really test, say, like even hundreds of different enhancer sequences. It's really only meant to test a handful of enhancers. And so over the past few years, a number of so-called massively parallel reporter assays or MPRAs have been, have been developed. Um, here we'll only talk about the first major one to be developed, mainly because once you understand how this kind of first MPRA works, then it's easy to understand how the rest of them work. And so the idea of the MPRA assay is that you start by you start by somehow finding a set of uh, on the order of like thousands or tens of thousands of candidate enhancer sequences uh, that you want to test. And so in this particular assay, uh, your enhancers have to be somewhere on the order of like 170 base pairs or less. And you basically synthesize these enhancer sequences on a programmable microarray. Uh, then what you do is you clone each enhancer sequence individually into a single plasmid, and that helps you produce essentially a short enhancer MPRA library. And so within each plasmid, you obviously have your uh, single enhancer candidate sequence. Uh, you also have a corresponding barcode that's unique to each uh, enhancer sequence. And then you also have an EGFP uh, reporter gene, uh, as well as a minimal promoter to drive expression of that EGFP uh, reporter gene. And so once you've constructed your enhancer library of say like tens of thousands of candidate enhancers, you then transfect them into a pool of uh, cells. So typically either like a cell line or um, yeah, you, you typically do this with cell lines uh, and then you initiate transcription. And so the general idea is that um, when you initiate transcription, generally speaking, uh, the more transcripts you have that uh, encode a certain barcode, then the more the basically the more active the corresponding enhancer associated with that barcode is. Um, one thing you have to be careful about is that um, because of kind of like varying uh, differences in transfection uh, efficiency or replication, um, you might not have the same number of plasmids encoding uh, any given enhancer sequence. And so when you basically what you do is once transcription is initiated, you go and do RNA sequencing, and that basically gives you the relative numbers of uh, barcodes corresponding to each enhancer sequence. Uh, but you have to normalize that count basically by DNA through DNA sequencing. So you want to sequence uh, DNA as well as RNAs because once you once you sequence the DNA barcodes, that tells you the relative numbers of starting copies uh, of each enhancer sequence, and then that basically lets you kind of scale the number of RNA. Uh, copies of each barcode sequence you see. Um, and so at the end of the day, your relative enhancer activity is basically some average of the ratios of how many RNA copies you see of each barcode divided by the number of DNA copies of each barcode you see, kind of averaged over multiple barcodes. So for any given enhancer, you typically have more than one barcode associated with that enhancer uh, as a, uh, in some sense, like a biological replicate. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, so that's that's the basic MPRA essay. Um, and the other ones are, are basically some variant of, of that, which some of them, for example, allow you to uh, test longer enhancers uh, or have higher throughput, for example. Um, some of the major applications of MPREs are, uh, number one, uh, one of the primary applications is what you would call enhancer mutagenesis. And so that's the idea that um, sometimes when you identify enhancers through epigenome sequencing, uh, some of these enhancers, for example, are like, you know, multiple KB long. And so oftentimes you want to kind of narrow down within this huge enhancer sequence where are all the, for example, transcription factor binding sites. And because remember all the transcription factor binding sites tend to be short, like six base pairs. And so you need to figure out where in these enhancers those TFBS are. And so what you can do is you can take individual enhancers and you can, for example, just uh, do like a scanning mutagenesis where you uh, introduce a different enhancer sequence. Uh, you introduce multiple enhancer variants where a single enhancer variant might differ from the endogenous enhancer by only one variant or one, uh, one nucleotide change. And you can mutate every single base pair along the entire enhancer sequence uh, and even introduce different base pair changes for each individual position in your enhancer. And so people have done studies where, for example, you can, uh, in, in a single study, you could, for example, introduce like 100,000 mutations into like three enhancers to really systematically uh, identify which individual bases within a you know, KB enhancer are actually uh, responsible for some amount of expression uh, in the expression of the reporter. And so the second major application of MPRAs is <clears throat> what you could call decoding enhancer logic. And so here the idea is that what you're actually synthesizing is a bunch of synthetic enhancers. So these are not endogenous to a given genome. But the goal of these kind of experiments is to really understand um, how different transcription factor binding sites uh, interact with each other. Or, you know, basically what you can do is you can like take, um, say, a pair of TFBS that you see in a genome uh, at a fixed distance. And you can vary that distance to see what the effect of uh, you know, changing the distance between pairs of transcription factor binding sites is, or you can change the orientation. And the idea here is that you're just essentially generating a whole bunch of synthetic enhancers to test what the effect of different parameters of these enhancers are on how they drive expression of your reporter. And finally, what you can also do is you can also do just plain enhancer screening, which basically involves uh, taking candidate enhancers you found using your histone uh, mark uh, assays and just testing how many of them actually uh, functionally drive expression uh, of your of your reporter gene. And you can also, in a limited way, introduce some uh, limited variants into each individual enhancer. But the broad goal of enhancer screening is really just to test a whole bunch of enhancers that you putatively identify from, yeah, like, for example, your chromatin states. So MPREs have a number of limitations, uh, first of which is that the enhancer sequences are initially synthesized on uh, microarrays. And so part of the problem is that the maximum length of these synthesized sequences is usually somewhere between 200 and maybe up to 500 base pairs. So this is a problem because some enhancers can go up to, say, like 10 KB or longer. And so if you can only clone in a short fragment of the full length enhancer, then you could be missing a lot of interactions between different parts of your enhancer sequence uh, inside your MPRA assay. The second problem is that uh, most of the MPRAs are carried out um, in an episomal manner. And so what that means is that uh, because they're not, because the plasmid's not integrated into the genome, uh, they don't generally acquire chromatin marks uh, or get influenced by other chromatin associated factors. And so uh, their context, the context in which you're testing the enhancer sequence is not native. Uh, the third problem is that a lot of enhancers uh, in particular tend to be much more tissue specific and context specific than say promoters. And so then part of the problem is that if you're going to, you know, if you suspect a certain sequence is uh, an enhancer sequence, you may not know what the correct cellular context or cell type uh, you should be testing this enhancer sequence uh, in is. And so, um, you know, you can run your MPRA essay, but uh, if you run it in, if you run it out of context, then you may not observe the 
uh, functional interactions or the activity that you might see in the correct context. And finally, uh, another problem with MPRA is that uh, in general, because you're removing these enhancer sequences from the surrounding genomic context uh, and basically putting it in this artificially designed reporter plasmid, um, you're again kind of testing it out of context. And so part of the problem is that enhancers generally work by, for example, looping around and uh, interacting with transcription start sites. Um, and so you basically lose this kind of enhancer promoter interactions or the looping or the chromosomal environment. Um, and none of that is taken into context with MPRA. Um, furthermore, uh, if you recall on the previous slide, uh, the MPRA assay uses a minimal promoter, uh, and that's different from the actual promoter that uh, is typically used endogenously. And so you could be missing potential enhancer promoter interactions, even ignoring the fact that you don't have any looping. And so, uh, I mean, a number of people have uh, thought of workarounds around this and I think one of the one of the directions in which the field seems to be moving is that um, people seem to be leaning more towards trying to do some kind of uh, what's called saturation genome editing and so there are the ideas that you could imagine um, endogenously uh, gene gene editing essentially different enhancer sequences uh, into pools of cells and then using using uh, single cell RNA sequencing for example uh, to measure readouts uh, of your enhancer sequences. And so that's one potential way around some of these MPRA limitations. And so I mentioned on the previous slide that MPRA is, relatively speaking, a kind of low throughput assay in the sense that the size of the regions that you can really thoroughly interrogate with MPRA is, is small relative to the length of some of the enhancers that are out there. And so more generally, you can't really use the MPRA assay to assess the functional impact of single base changes, for example, for every base of the entire genome, right? And so you need some way of kind of narrowing down the entire genome to regions that are more likely to contain, for example, transcription factor binding sites. And so one way you can do that is, for example, to use uh, ChIP-seq assays for like histone modifications to broadly identify enhancers and so on and so on. But even then, as I mentioned on the previous slide, if your enhancer is like 10 KB long, it's impractical to really run MPRA regularly on regions that are that long. And so it's oftentimes important from a practical standpoint to be able to look within even, for example, individual enhancers and basically identify those bases that are most likely to be important or that should at least be tested uh, in an MPRA assay. And so one of the ways in which you can do this from a practical standpoint is that you can take, for example, alignments of related species, and you can look for sequence conservation across that alignment. And so here, for example, I've shown you a hypothetical region of the genome that's aligned between human, monkey, marmoset, uh, gorilla, mandrill, and orangutan. So those are all primates. And so the idea here is that, um, like we talked about previously in the sequence analysis lecture, regions of the genome that tend to be conserved across evolution are more likely to be important in some way. And that's that's generally the assumption that, that we make uh, in this context. And so the idea here is that if you have an alignment of, say for example, a candidate enhancer in human, and you, you know align that region across all of these different primates, then presumably speaking, if there are transcription factor binding sites for example, that are really important to the function of this enhancer. And if that transcription factor binding site is conserved across these different primates, then you might be able to see that uh, by identifying positions of this alignment where there's high degree of sequence conservation relative to everything else in that same region. And so here in this hypothetical alignment, I'm illustrating two such uh, regions in this alignment colored in red, where those regions are, you know, highly conserved relative to the to the sequence around it. And so generally speaking, again, alignment is one way of identifying conserved positions, which probably are, are at least more likely to do uh, important things, which should then be tested using an assay like MPRA. And so an important side point here is that I said that you should align some, you know, related species. 
um, so that you can identify the conserved regions relative to you know the unconserved regions around it. But an important question is you know, what species exactly should you choose? How, how distantly related should these species be? And so some important questions to think about are, you know, here I've shown you an alignment of, you know, primate genomes. But what happens if you pick a set of uh, genomes that are actually even closer than that? So suppose you um, sequence the genomes of like really close human relatives, for example. Um, would that be as useful for identifying conserved regulatory elements? And it's also useful to think about, well, what happens if you go the other road, go down the other uh, road, which is to say, okay, what if I took a bunch of genomes from organisms that are, you know, that diverged quite long ago? Um, how, you know, how likely is it that transcription factor binding sites will be highly conserved there? And, you know, how likely will it be that they're easily identifiable from these alignments? So just to wrap up this portion of the lecture, um, just to summarize, basically for most of the histone modifications we talked about, uh, you can just use your standard ChIP-C protocol to assay them across the genome. Uh, for CPG dinucleotide methylation specifically, you can just use bisulfite sequencing like we talked about. And so one of the most important take home messages from this part of the lecture so far is that there are many post-translational modifications possible for histone tails. Uh, there's like more than 50 of them known. Um, and so that leaves you with a lot of potential histone modification combinations that are possible, right? And so if you have 50 histone marks, then you could have, for example, up to two to the 50 number of combinations of those marks. And so that's a pretty scary number of combinations to look at. But it turns out that uh, thus far anyways, most people have observed that even though there's many possible combinations, um, in practice, there's relatively few of them that occur very frequently. And most possible combinations either don't occur at all or occur at a really small frequency. And so uh, that's kind of nice because um, on one hand, that means that, you know, in terms of characterizing the effect of histone modifications on gene regulation, the problem's not as hard as it could be. Uh, the other uh, more subtle benefit is that, um, or a, a corollary observation is, is basically that a lot of histone modifications uh, tend to co-occur frequently. And so what that means is that they're correlated. And so why this is helpful is because if you're trying to design an experiment to assay as few chromatin marks as possible, if you have two very highly correlated uh, histone modifications, then you might only need to assay like one of them in order to get information on both of them if they're super highly correlated. Um, and so oftentimes what that means is that when you're designing an assay and you're say you have like a thousand samples you want to uh, do chip seek on uh, you don't need to assay 50 histone modifications in all thousand samples you might only need to assay say a core set of five or seven histone marks and that'll tell you about much of the rest of the histone modifications uh, that you could have assayed um, one final important mark remark is that uh, like other tools we've talked about in this class you can modify the CRISPR-Cas9 system in order to do kind of interesting things. And so, for example, uh, you could take nucleus null uh, Cas9 and you could fuse different types of epigenetic modifiers to them uh, in order to basically build a tool for perturbing gene regulation in a way that doesn't involve actual gene editing. Right. And so, for example, P300 is a co-transcriptional activator, uh, which effectively acts as a uh, histone acetyltransferase. And so... It basically can activate enhancers, and so you can basically use CRISPR-Cas9 with a guide RNA to target enhancers in order to activate enhancers um, endogenously.